this is going to be the best panel of the day. Uh, and the reason it's going to be the best panel is because we've got two rock star CEOs here, uh, both business software companies. Jennifer uh, took over a struggling startup and turned it into a unicorn, magic. Uh, uh, went public in April at what, 1.8 billion? Something like that. Doubled since then. I think she deserves a round of applause. Yeah. It's a pretty impressive accomplishment. Thank you. And Sasan heads one of Fortune's uh, 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 favorite companies, a company we've had an eye on for a long time, 11 years on the best companies to work for list, which was really impressive, and then recently showed up on a, on a newer list that Fortune does called the Future 50. That's a, a focus on companies. It's a great methodology, by the way, that we worked with BCG on developing that, that uh, analyzes companies to see who's really focused on creating future value, not what you're doing today, but what the, the, how the market and how your uh, internal documents suggest you're focusing on creating future value on that list. So, uh, and they have promised to share the secrets of their success with all of you right here, right now. And Jennifer, I'm gonna make you go first. I know both of you are customer obsessed, uh, but what does that mean? So it means that uh, every waking hour of the day you're spending thinking about how uh, your customers are trying to get their jobs done and what their ultimate goals are and what are the obstacles and barriers that they find in their way of success. And in our case, that started at the developer level. The developer as a user, someone who is innovating and creative and building the future products for their customers and finding that when things don't work in production the way they anticipate they will, that disruption, um, that interruption, the, the emotional stress, the business impact of something not working the way it's supposed to for an end customer was not only stressful, uh, but also made it harder for them to do their day job when they were available to do their day job. And this is just imagine, you know, you're, um, it's tax season and people are filing their uh, tax forms and the website goes down or the mobile app goes down and, and things don't go down so much anymore, they just go slow, you get the spinner of death something bad happens, and nowadays, uh, consumers will give you about three seconds before they just yeah. quit and give up. And, and when, that, yeah, when that happens, what used to happen was 100 or 200 people would get on a phone bridge and try and figure it out. And if you've ever tried to problem <laughs> solve with 200, exactly, you've been on those. <laughs> ever tried to problem solve with 200 of your closest friends, it's really hard. <laughs> So fast forward 10 years since the business started, almost everything that we do in our daily lives, from the moment we wake up in the morning to ordering our coffee, to the playlist that we run with while we track our exercise, to checking Slack to see what our colleagues are up to, is running in some ways dependent on the cloud, and you're expecting it to work perfectly all the time. And when it doesn't, you're angry. And so PagerDuty is sitting behind all of those leading brands, helping teams not only respond more effectively by getting the right signal to the right person at the right time, but increasingly predict and prevent event storms or issues from becoming customer impacting incidents. And you're now doing this for what? Half of the Fortune 50, I think. More than half of the Fortune 100 and over a third of the Fortune 500. And uh, increasingly our focus is, is become inclusive of not only the developer community and engineering leadership, but more broadly CTOs and CIOs and line of business. Because yeah. PagerDuty is now being leveraged as a real time sort of digital operations platform for workflows across a yeah. business. And Sasan, that customer focus, I've, I've heard it at Intuit, not Intel, Intuit, we got this right. You, you, you tell- I thought I got a promotion. Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure Bob would have been too happy about that. But, uh, that that you actually tell your people to go out and like embed themselves with the customers, follow the customers around. It sounds a little creepy, but yeah. I get the. I get well, you the. know, we do, and uh, first of all, the credit to our founder, you know, Scott Cook. We were born in the era of DOS, and so we had to traverse DOS to Windows to the cloud and and to the platform. And the only way you do that is to fall in love with the customer problem and not your solutions. And so. We have a methodology that we train all 9,000 of our employees on, and it's called customer-driven innovation and design for delight. And so our expectation is that we're doing two things. One, we're following the data, because the data always leads you to what problems the customer has. But two, with the customer's permission, we follow them to the place of business, literally, their home. Literally, literally follow them, yeah. And uh, we will observe them. We'll observe how they use their product. Uh, we'll observe the pain points that they have. And not our product. We'll observe how they use uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, Google Sheets to run their business, or how they do their taxes. 
and we try to figure out how can we or others that build on our platform solve their problem. Yeah. And it's something that we try to get uh, really uh, rigorous about. Uh, the other thing I've seen that unites the two of you is that you both have a commitment to diversity, not just as a good idea, mm -hmm. but as a necessary part of the formula to success. Well, we see diversity and inclusion and uh, equality as a strategic imperative and the way to do business and, and outperform our, our peers in the category. And uh, in doing so, we have a gender balanced leadership team. Our board is very close to gender parity. We're an odd number. So uh, I got to get to and an even number parity. to get to perfect parity. <laughs> Um, and over 40% of our leadership roles are held by women. Um, we are very focused on ensuring that we not only identify uh, richly diverse talent pools, but importantly, when an employee comes into pager duty, they feel that they can do their very best work, the best work in their career, uh, and be their authentic self in the workplace. And to do that, you have to have a culture uh, that demands a certain standard of behavior and uh, including inclusive behavior. And you also have to be able to operationalize some of these things. So it's not just about making sure half your final candidate slate is diverse or underrepresented. It's also about making sure that when uh, an individual comes into pager duty, they, they um, see other people that they can relate to. They recognize that their voice is not only heard, but um, expected and wanted, and that they know that their teams are going to work hard to ensure they're successful, not just to ensure their own success. Well, you know, just to build on what Jennifer just shared, uh, for me, it hits close to home, because I was born in Tehran, in Iran, and I came to the US, <laughs> and six months later, Iran took the hostages. And it was a tough period of my life, because uh, I was bullied at school. People told me to go back home. And, um, and this whole notion of uh, inclusion hits home because I know what it feels like uh, not to be wanted, not to be a part of something. And so for us, that really translates to how it's important at Intuit. Divers diversity is a fact, uh, inclusion is a, is a choice. And so very much like Jennifer, you know, over 60% of my uh, team are women executives. And we have a very diverse leadership team. We have great diversity across the, the company, but it's in a strategic imperative, just as you said, because our customers are diverse. Yep. And so it's critical for us to be able to deliver for our customers that we have folks that are building the platform and the products that are actually also yep. diverse. So you're both in the business software business. You remember the days when business software was boring and only consumer-facing software. I, I remember the days when you shipped business software on tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else remember that? So. But, but we've been hearing here all morning uh, about how AI is going to transform the way businesses operate. It's obviously going to have a profound effect on both of your businesses. How are you uh, preparing for this next wave of disruption? Well, in, in our case, we talk about AI in this context. You know, there were two platforms uh, that really ignited innovation. One was electricity, which was long before our time, and pre and post electricity, there was massive innovation. The other one was the internet. If you think about life before the internet and after the internet, uh, our view is AI is that third platform that will fundamentally change the world. We define AI as machine learning, knowledge engineering, uh, and natural language processing. And it is critical for our customers. You know, we, we have platforms like QuickBooks that small businesses use to run their business. And AI is critical to help our customers get paid the next day. Uh, it's critical to reducing the number of clicks and screens in TurboTax. And so we're actually applying machine learning to everything that we're doing just so we can find ways to revolutionize the experience for our customers. It's key to the future. And we've been investing in machine learning and AI for some time because our platform sits at this really interesting intersection of people and their behaviors. There's the psychology of how teams work under time uh, and emotional pressure, and equally the increasing complex and proliferating technology ecosystem that our, our employees and, and people are working in where you're seeing um, serverless architecture, microservices, continuous deployment driving uh, a complexity in that technology, that digital ecosystem that humans can't manage. Mm -hmm. And so there's the challenge of, Great, now I've got all this data, all these signals coming into me, but how do I know what they mean? And how do I find the one that's really problematic or is, is a huge opportunity, but then get the right people on top of it in the few seconds and minutes that matter? And 
Um, one of our customers is a, a company called SightLife that manages corneal transplants. And um, corneals, corneas are, are viable for less than something like 90 hours. And so the process of matching a donor to a recipient, preserving the cornea, transiting it, et cetera, that, that's a real-time challenge yeah. and opportunity. And the, one team doesn't know another. So they use our platform to orchestrate that work. And um, when you think about how you leverage AI and machine learning, what it does is it's capturing not only the event signals, the team behavior, but also how all of these things become dependent on one another, and you can start to see patterns. What, what, what does it mean? We were talking about this earlier today. What does it mean for the future of work? Obviously, some people think it's going to eliminate jobs and create I think it depends on your philosophy. In our case, we look at how we can leverage automation and leverage AI to improve the, the amount of mission-driven work that a person does versus repetitive, mundane work. And likewise, how to increase the productivity and the outcomes of now, the work that you, you say that, and I think somebody else was saying it on the stage earlier today, but at Fortune, we did a survey of Fortune 500 CEOs uh, in March. And one of the questions we asked was, to the extent you're using AI, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. Are you using it to reduce business process cost, or are you using it to rethink the value you create for your customers? 69% said business process cost, mm -hmm. 69%. Uh, you know, so in our case, it, it, it all starts with the customer. We're focused on three things for our customers. One is finding ways to put more money in their pocket. Uh, two, eliminating work and drudgery so they can focus on their passion. And then third, making sure that they can do what they do with total confidence. And with AI, I mean, we're putting money, we're helping our small businesses get paid much faster now than they could before. We're helping them uh, hold on to their payroll money uh, seven days more than they would otherwise, because in small business, usually they have to, money goes out of their account seven days in advance before an employee gets paid. Now we do same day funding. Those are just examples of rather than improving the workflow, just talking into your phone and saying, how many customers owe me money? Uh, who's my most profitable customers? Can you send Mary this invoice? And so we are entirely focused on applying AI, uh, specifically in this case, machine learning and knowledge engineering. To create value for customers. To create totally. value for our customers, because we've got incredible <clears throat> companies like Jennifer's, PagerDuty, Slack, and others that are actually creating incredible platforms that we're using internally to drive significant productivity. So we're focused on what's core to us, which is our customers, and leveraging incredible platforms like Slack, Atlassian, PagerDuty to drive productivity. So that's interesting. Internal. So we started with customer focus. It's really your customer focus that leads you to apply AI in a way that adds value that's rather right. than simply reduces costs. Totally. That's right. Yeah. That's totally. Right. And, and increasingly, like, I mean, our, our core community started out as the developer community, and these are people who embrace technology changes. Right. Yeah. Right? And they, they, they are looking for solutions that help them get things done smarter, better, faster all the time. They want to be empowered with the information that enables them to make big decisions where historically technology was built in sort of a command and control um, mm -hmm. model. And so, so they're actually pretty open to the idea of a suggestion engine that says to them, this event that you're experiencing right now, it's happened before the last time it happened. Here's the, you know, the process you ran. Press this radio button to run that automatically. It empowers them. It totally right. empowers them. Yeah. And also, you know, much like um, physicians who do ER rotations, when you're a technology worker and you're on call, you learn a lot under time pressure and you see things that you don't see in your day-to-day -day work. So there's also the benefit of learning that comes out of that. And our platform is learning that across our entire customer base for the benefit of individual customers and users. And they recognize the value in that as well. Question back there and then up front. My name is Jonathan Greenblatt. I'm the CEO of a nonprofit called the ADL. And I want to ask Sasana a question because we're sort of B2C like you. And you talked about diversity and the issue of gender parity and the issue of sort of ethnic diversity. But one of the things I struggle with running something like a medium-sized public equity is age diversity. And how do you engage kind of millennials in the decision-making process, not just observing your customers where they are, but rather in thinking from a corporate perspective how you run your organization? So I'd love to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a tough topic. Uh, you know, what, what we try to do is, is listen. Uh, we spend a lot of time, including myself personally, uh, talking to our customers, talking to the digital natives that have joined the workforce, talking to uh, those that are, have years of experience in terms of uh, what's important to you. Do you understand what's important to digital natives? And uh, what does management look like of a digital native? What's important to them? Uh, 
you recognize how purpose-driven they are and you know, how to help them with the choices they make, the work uh, that they do, uh, how to create a community. So my biggest advice is uh, listen uh, and ask questions uh, from all parties because when you've been in the workforce for 20 to 30 years and you've got a digital native that comes in, there's just so many generational gaps uh, that the only way to get at the, the, the solve is to listen and ask a lot of questions and learn. If I could, uh, could I add to that just really quickly? I'm, I'm on the board of Estee Lauder, <coughs> which is one of the fastest and largest, uh, fastest growing and largest uh, luxury brand companies. And they have this very interesting reverse mentoring program um, with over, I think it's around 200 people. Each, each member of the senior leadership team has a reverse mentor, a millennial within the organization. And they not only work on scheduled uh, mentorship meetings, but they also have a joint project together. And so there's this constant feedback from the millennial community coming into a large you know, Fortune 100 public company leadership team in a very structured way that has been really enlightening for, for both parties. And it, when I joined PagerDuty three years ago, I brought the average age up into the 30s. <laughs> so I, if you want to talk about millennials later, I'm happy to spend some time on that. It's great. We have like 45 seconds left. How quick can you say your question? Super fast. Hi, Jason from Comparably. Nice to see you both. Proud Insult alum. What do you do around retention? Your teams are focused on cost per hire. You know those stats. A lot of money goes into hiring. How do you keep that good talent in the doors and not get a poached? And you, you each get five words, Sam. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> Make every moment count and understand what motivates them. Yep. And then drive really hard to deliver on those things and don't get distracted by the she things that are important. It's a, it's a good uh, answer. Uh, uh, for us, it's all about the work that they do. If they do work that matters, they stay. Great. Good. Sasan, Jennifer, thank you so much. Thank Great you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Hey, thanks. <laughs>